Hi, and welcome to Fathoms Deep, a Black Sales podcast from Common Room Radio. I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. I have to say, I mean, you know, we watch these episodes a lot and we've been watching them for the past few months, but somehow uh-huh. that it's a new season, when I hear the opening credits, I just get so excited again. Like, I it's know. It's just so yes. much fun, right? Yeah. You're, because you're having the opening credits, you're like, oh, new stuff. I'm going to see new stuff. I'm going to see something brand new. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with you. And uh, and no cold open we talked about last time. So it is just straight into the theme, which is actually pretty cool. It's like the overture at a theater, which I quite like. I just, I never get tired of this opening credits. I really don't. I know. It's really so gorgeously drawn and so beautifully done. Yeah, I completely agree. So you know which episode this is? 30. 30. Oh, no, I didn't realize. Yeah. You know, I just wrote 402 in my notes because I wasn't sure. Right. But yeah, episode 30. Wow. I know, right? You know, it doesn't feel like we've been doing that this long. We've been doing this a while. Wow. Plus all of our bonus episodes. That's pretty impressive. Sail! These are our parts. Uh, we have a new character, which I'm very excited about, and I'm leaving him to the end. So we're going to start out ah. talking about NASA, which is, well, everyone, pretty much. That's a lot of people. So I don't I'm going to say there's a lot of people on NASA well, right now, yeah, but yeah. I guess that's what, uh, Rogers, oh, no, there's tons of people on NASA. Okay, right. yep. So we have Rogers, right. Eleanor, Max, Berenger, right. and we see Featherstone and Adele. Of just for a little yes. bit, but it was really lovely to see them. It was. Um, uh-huh. And then our second grouping will be uh, Flint and Maddie and Billy. Oh, I loved and everything with them. I okay. thought you would. Uh-huh. And, yeah. And then our fourth grouping is going to be Jack and Anne and Teach. And I love everything in this part yes. so much. Mm-hmm. And then I'm saving for last uh, Silver and Israel Silver Hands. And Israel. Okay. Uh, and Max, we get a little Max right at the end, so we'll put we'll have. Oh that yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, we do. We get, we get a small but very poignant scene with Max. So. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, so we'll talk about that last, the end of the episode. Okay. All right. Let's get into our characters. All right, that sounds great. Prepare to board. Hi. All right. So we start out our NASA bit uh, with Max and Featherstone and Adele, yeah. and I just want to say, like. I kind of love how proper Featherstone and Adele look now. Like Adele's quite covered up, still quite cleavagey, but like really cleavagey. But she's, you know, there's a lot to hide. So (laughs) it would would be wrong if we didn't have some amount of cleavage. But um, but really a very structured dress. Like she's really gone down that road of like a very beautiful dress. Not that she wasn't beautiful before, but, you know, different style of beautiful. Yes. And Featherstone with his very beardedness and his... uh, Seems to have gotten the whole, you know, tit curtain usage uh-huh. correct Figured now. Out. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we have Berenger overseeing the preparation of the gallows. And Featherstone and Adele are watching. And Max, uh, this yeah, this is a hard Max episode for me. This, I'm very this sad is and Max worried episode. for Max, right? Yeah. So she uh, she's choosing sides here in a way that seems awfully risky and then of course i mean even before we got to the end i was worried for her right and i think i mean she's trying to hedge her bets i suppose as best she can although think about her in 310 right think about her in 310 where she was saying to mapleton um you know mapleton was questioning why she didn't give away the insiders which she still hasn't i mean she's standing there talking to them but you know she made such a point with mapleton of saying that she was going to let the players play their game so that she could right. see who who was going to come out on top but mm-hmm. we see I mean we saw this already in the last episode the way you know she is a different person the way she was so humbly yeah. speaking to Rogers right right and here um the thing it seems an odd choice that she has chosen this more subservient role in civilization when she had more power and esteem in the you know the the land of uh, of the Nassau pirates, I suppose. Right, but we have to remember, like this goes back to her backstory. Like this is what right. she was determined to do. This is what she said to Anne. Why they need to separate? Because this was the road she was going to go down. She just doesn't look very happy in it. No, 
she's not been happy for a while. She wasn't happy in the end yeah. of season three. I was very, this is why, this is where I came up with my whole thing about maybe people need to leave, leave aside their motivations that stem from their backstories because look yes. where Max is. She is not, I mean, she's still hopeful, obviously. She says to them that Beringer is a necessary but temporary evil. Right. And she's still mm -hmm. working towards, she's still obviously working towards this goal she has in her mind of there being civilization minus this, you know, reign of terror that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that's a realistic thing to hope for, we'll have yeah. to see. I don't think Max has shown a moment in either the last episode or this episode of deluding herself or not being smart about stuff. But she's in a precarious place and she's she trying is. to navigate Absolutely. that as well as possible mm. while keeping her her moral core. I mean, that's also an interesting thing that we have here is that when she does put herself in danger in this episode, it is because she is trying to navigate a thing where she still should be part of civilization. Ah, you yeah. see what I'm saying? Okay, yeah. but let's talk about this first. The There's not that much to say about this first moment. Um I think it's interesting that she chose now to to make it known to Featherstone and Adele that she was the one that foiled their plan. Yeah. And she explained to them that she had made a deal to keep them safe, like that she had made a deal with the governor right. to keep them safe. Now, uh, Max should know from experience that deals one makes with authority figures don't always work out. Yes, <laughs> especially in this show. Yeah. Right. But yes, yeah, but that's where we stand with that. But yes, I think the main thing, the main theme of this episode for Max is how she's trying to navigate within this kind of like gotten out of control version of Nassau that I mm -hmm. don't know if she foresaw. I don't think this is what she thought was going to end up happening. Yeah. Okay. So next we have Eleanor and Rogers talking in their bedroom. And I really yes. enjoyed having Eleanor compare her grandfather to the pirates that he would, she said he was a pirate of another sort. This kind of fits in with the things I've always said about Eleanor is that she was kind of like a gangster in a pirate story. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. That's what it felt like more to me. Like, again, I know you've not seen The Godfather, but kind of like, a, a, <laughs> sorry, kind of I like a... Sopranos, is right. that... <laughs> no, because they never tried to go straight, really. Um, but like, like a mafia family that got wealthy enough in it and have enough enough influence and power that they could kind of pretend at least that they were that they were entering the the legitimate world I won't call it civilization because I would think we would we would count right. always as part of civilization but um but yeah that was what's interesting is that basically her argument was that he's got money he can offer us all the things we need right and what we can offer him is legitimacy which is, I think we talked about that last episode, that she, as as being the wife of a governor, could finally have something, yes, that her family was interested in. It still seems like a really big risk. She did not seem particularly confident that this was going to go over. No, I mean, but they're in a pinch. I mean, they, they are in she's, a pinch. She's, yeah. she's definitely, um, you know, she's going for the long shot. It's funny. I keep thinking about what Toby said, like how we kept, how he said that Jack's, Jack, you know, he, he loves the long shot, but, oh, but uh -huh. so many characters have no choice but to go for the long shot, but they're not enjoying right. it. Like Eleanor yes. and Rogers are not enjoying this. There's, there. This yeah, is like that's absolutely right, right? So it was just well, and I was so, so surprised by Eleanor in this scene when she said, "All we need, all Nassau needs." That's very new language for her too. Mm -hmm. To be thinking about Nassau, or, or I guess she always did, but but she definitely thought mostly about her place in it, and now she's seeming to think about it as colony i think that she's really right. shifted her perspective absolutely because of her relationship to uh to rogers i think so too i think and, and she's just matured i mean i just think that she really she, has i think that she's a character that we can a lot of characters change have changed over time i feel like eleanor mm -hmm. is a character that we could actually say that we've watched her change in a direction of becoming more mature ah uh, mm -hmm. uh at least now i mean again I think that's completely right end of season three I like her more with every episode. I really do. Yeah. I mean, again, I, I still... And not everybody still, does, but I like her and Rogers a lot. I know. I do, too. I, I definitely do? do. I do. No, I totally like them. 
I guess the only bit that gives me pause is that he kind of scares me suddenly. Like I liked him yes, very much true. in season three. And now I've already, um, last episode, he just was a little scary, not scary mm-hmm. like Beringer, but scary right. in that he was so capable of watching this brutality and not seeming particularly moved by it. That is very true. Yeah. Um, so yeah, his, his new, his, it's not a new coldness. He has a coldness towards violence and hard decisions already in this season right. that I don't find surprising. Like, I don't feel like that is in conflict at all to the person we saw in season three. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, he said to Flint, like, um, what did he say? You know, if, if you, I, that now I've seen. Right. On the beach scene, like he said, if you cast me as your villain, I will be it. Or maybe that's what Flint said in the end of season two. I always get confused with the two of them. I think Flint said monster and he said villain. He said monster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that was the thing. There was this progression of like Jack telling him that we're all villains and then him Mm -hmm. saying to Flint, you know, all right, I'll do that thing. If if that's what you require of me, I'll do that thing. So, so it's been a progression, but I don't feel like it ever is in conflict to the person we've seen from the very beginning. It's just now, right. now he's just really doing that thing. And so cold. I don't know. It's something we always talk about, like when Flint is like kind of crazy face, scary person, but to me, always right. the most terrifying people are the ones who can be terrifying and emotionless or seemingly emotionless at the same time. Oh, yeah. Well, he has a lot on the line right now, Rogers does. And I think we're, we're just seeing him in stress. And people change in stress. They Their do. Their personality really does. Right. Yeah. Again, I don't know if this is a big change. I feel like this is just a different side of the person we've seen all along. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the thing I wanted to bring up about Eleanor's story about her grandfather is that she said he was a pirate of some of another sort, but that he wanted to build something more. And then she talks about what, you know, that he built and he became influential right. and wealthy. And I just feel like that, that's such a common thing with Eleanor, was that sure. Eleanor was yeah. a pirate of a sort, but did always have this idea of building something from it. Mm. And so it's interesting, like, does Eleanor, like, kind of identify with her grandfather? Is this just a family trait? I don't know if Richard really had that to the same extent. I feel like Richard was more in it for himself. Yes. And, but yeah. Eleanor has always, you know, she's expressed it in different, sometimes better, sometimes worse ways. But I think that would be a good description of her. Right. That she wanted to build something. Right. Okay. So then, uh, then we get to see the message from Teach. Which was amazing. <laughs> that was <laughs> haunting. The so hanging you... redcoats in the ship was, yep. oh, terrifying right it was and you see eleanor panic you see that panic with her chest heaving you don't see eleanor in a panic very often no we get to see some emotional notes from eleanor here that we had never we seen really before do, that we've never seen yeah, yeah it's so true she has in a sense more to lose now mm-hmm. mm. well and because she's not just in it for herself like now exactly. she actually yeah. has someone she cares about enough to want him to succeed to want him yes. to survive Yep. Definitely. <laughs> so, and when Beringer is talking to them, he says that Teach has, this is a message from Teach, and Teach has more of their hostages. Right. And we yeah. know already from the last episode that Beringer's main motivation is concern for his men. Was yes. You know, he wants mm-hmm. revenge for the ones who had been killed. So we're definitely seeing, you know, just a little bit of an edge to what his motivations in this Mm -hmm. scenario with teach might be. Okay. So our next scene in NASA are uh, Max and Behringer watching the trials. Oh yeah. If, if trials is what we can call them, Mm -hmm. but yeah. And so he makes his point that there had been um, 12 trials that morning and no one has shown remorse. Right. And then, yeah, Max, uh, I wish she would actually keep a little bit more quiet with Beringer, but I really like what she says. She says, uh, perhaps it's too much to ask for remorse. If you've had, I think she said, if you've had 12 trials in as many hours. Right. Yeah. And they're all convicted without. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
without any real trial to speak of. Exactly. Yeah, they're really just convictions. Let's just call them convictions and not trials. Is I think exactly. What she's saying. I think yeah. that's much more appropriate. And and then he mm-hmm. questions uh, whether she believes in this system. And then I like what she says. She says, "I don't oppose trials. I don't oppose hangings." I do object to spectacle. Spectacle, yeah, which was very, very smart. She, well, Max, Max is our lady for smartness. She's very smart. And she's, again, she has a goal. She's, this goes back to what she said when she first took over Eleanor's place in the end of season two, where, Mm -hmm. remember where Frasier, uh, was it, I think it was Frasier who questioned, who questioned her taking over. And Max said that, that she was not planning on leading the way Eleanor did, that power yes. least perceived. Mm-hmm. And again, that's not the most democratic idea. No, I suppose not. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But she does understand. I mean, again, she has a goal. I don't, I don't know if democracy was ever Max's goal, really. Um, but she wants the stall go away. She wants her quiet. She wants, yes, she wants. Yeah. And she definitely said as much this episode. Exactly. And so this spectacle is not serving that purpose. Um, in addition to it, you know, not being particularly fair. Um, mm-hmm. But I think, I think for her, the main, the main focus is not on necessarily the fairness, but on the, the thing that she brings up with Eleanor. What, what is the line she says? She says to Eleanor a little bit later, there are men on both sides who are whose identities are so enmeshed in this conflict that they're more afraid of it ending than losing it. Oh, and she's like speaking that. about yeah. Berenger, right? And right. So uh-huh. I think this is really her point is that she's just watching all of this and she's so concerned um, that Berenger and, you know, I guess by you know, extend that out and it ends up being part of Rogers. I mean, I think Rogers right, would agree yeah. with her completely that he would like for this to end. Mm-hmm. Um, but she sees Berenger as a dangerous choice as a person to be, to be uh, enforcing it because mm-hmm. she sees him as one of these people who has no end goal. It's just the process of the fight and wow, we've known other people like that who are revenge and who fight for the sake of fighting. I just wanted to bring that up, that that's what Miranda said to Flint. When yeah. Oh, well, that's right. And in that, 205. Yes. She said, you're fighting for the sake of fighting. For the sake of it. Yeah. Oh, which was certainly true at the time. Right. I mean, I feel like this episode, I know we're not doing thesis statements, but I feel like this episode, you know, a, a big theme of this episode is vengeance and where does it get us Mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah right we'll get to that with with teach and jack especially yes Mm -hmm. but this is throughout i mean berenger is a person in the last episode rogers brought that up that when berenger Mm -hmm. wanted to go chase the revenge and berenger said well my men are pretty motivated by that same thing Mm mm-hmm Um, so this is a really interesting kind of i feel like it's not a new it's not a new dichotomy it's it's one that we've had throughout i mean people who who are motivated by vengeance and people who are Mm -hmm. motivated not by vengeance but i feel like this episode's like super super about that so okay so but back to max and berenger the main part of this that i that i really found fascinating was that um he talked about there being a new dead soldier so basically he's 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 yeah, he's just kind of terrifying. Like, he's like every regime that is, you know, trying to stomp out terrorism. And it's just like, yeah, we can just get rid of rights for the sake of safety. Right. Yeah. So he says uh, the war's not over and he talks, he calls them radicals. Mm-hmm. And he says, you could be doing more if you chose. And that's when she brings up that there were promises made from the governor to her and her to her informants. Yes. And then Uh she says, if oaths are no longer kept and boundaries no longer respected, then there's no civilization left to defend. And I don't know what we're fighting for. Oh, yeah, that was very good. And this just makes me think, you know, Max should have been sitting with us, you know, watching this show. (laughs) (laughs) Had Max been watching this show with us and and we could have maybe been like, you know what, this this whole this whole 
this whole dream you have of civilization being this just and fair place. Right. Like, maybe. You're kidding yourself. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Perhaps, Max, you have you have some yeah. sort of dream about civilization that isn't the one we've been watching. So, yeah, that's just a really. Yeah, this is just I'm just worried for Max. I really I don't know. We had everyone do their season four make a wish. I uh-huh. really, my wish for Max is that she like figures this out. That this is not yes. a good road for her. Yeah, you want her to come out on top. <laughs> I know. I do. I very much it's want her to come out on top. It's not looking great for her just now. I have not, to say, no, because she's really yeah. In this episode, she's managed to like really piss Beringer off and then really piss Silver off. I'm really yeah, very that concerned. Is not good. Yes, it's not good. So insane to me, though, that they're leaving Behringer in charge of Nassau. I agree. That, I think, more than anything, shows that dark side of Rogers that you were referring to, Mm -hmm. that coldness. Well, and Eleanor, too, that she says maybe terror is what Nassau needs right now. Right. I know. Exactly. Exactly. Back to this idea of Mm -hmm. styles of leadership and power perceived and not perceived. She said he was loyal and strong which are considered virtues, I suppose. But then also, yeah, that he strikes terror in the hearts of everyone in the, on the island. Mm-hmm. Which is maybe what they need. Ah, uh, I don't, it doesn't sit well with me. No, it doesn't sit well with me either. And I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't. Okay. Yeah. We're back to like, I don't think Eleanor's being so smart right now. I mean, I think she's yeah. focused on different things and she, she's maybe trusting Rogers too much. I mean, maybe it's funny. Like in the last episode, there was all this conversation, which I loved about the, you know, where she was standing up to them and them partners, but perhaps part of their partnership is that, that she has moved into a place of trusting him and maybe not listening to her own inner smart voice, which sometimes Eleanor has, and sometimes she doesn't have. So Uh (laughs) So (laughs) <laughs> I feel like Ele- Eleanor is sometimes smart. I can't, I can't. Well, Eleanor has changed a lot with her relationship with Rogers. She mm-hmm. had her, her whole perspective has shifted and it's almost like she sees from his point of view instead of from hers anymore. Right. And that's a hard thing for, for me to adjust to. Mm-hmm. I like it. I, I, I mean, it works for me because their relationship seems so strong and because they're such great partners. They make really excellent partners and their communication is very good. Mm-hmm. They respect one another very well. But I feel like her point of view has been lost or, or yielded to his. It's possible. Yeah, we're just going to have to see how that all plays out. Mm. And again, yeah, I'm just not sure how enlightened a leader Rogers is to begin with. I mean, that's, you know, we didn't, mm-hmm. we saw that he's like pretty, like last season, we saw that he had a plan. We saw right. that he was like pretty good at strategy, although he really leaned heavily on Max and Eleanor to like do yes. the strategy for yeah, him. Yeah, he really did. Um, we've never really seen from him what an ideal, like what his vision is for NASA. I mean, aside from being a That's colony. That's true. It seems more like he was appointed. It seems more like it's his duty than it was his vision. Right. I mean, and the idea of pardons was, you know, that is a very enlightened idea, although, you know, it was one mm-hmm. he took that had already been out there. But right. but I mean, the fact that he wanted to do that is, is you know, a statement in his favor. But we, I feel like we've not quite gotten a sense of what his ideals are, like what, what he yes. sees as this post- this future NASA that is part of civilization and mm-hmm. isn't at war. And maybe we will get that. And maybe we won't. I mean, maybe that's part of his failings. Maybe that's what, you know, maybe that will be part of his personality is that perhaps he's lacking that vision. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm just, I'm curious. It's interesting because the way Eleanor is talking now is what's giving me the most insight into Rogers's vision. Mm-hmm. Because like when she says, Something about bringing Nassau out of the dark. Mm -hmm. That is not Eleanor language at all. Bringing Mm -hmm. Nassau out of the dark. Hmm. Like she was the dark of Nassau. So that's really showing to me anyway, that shifted perspective into, into Rogers's point of view. Well, but she always thought that she was doing the dark deed she was doing for the sake of a future Nassau. I mean, she didn't, she always won. I mean, that's why she and Flint were in coalition from the beginning was because mm-hmm. they, they shared that vision 
of of NASA being independent and right. no longer a pirate play. Like she, you know, remember how inspired she was in the very beginning of season one when he told her the Odysseus story. That is true. Yes. It's just the word darkness, I think, that surprised mm-hmm. me. Hmm. Interesting. Like it's more metaphorical than how she would normally look at the situation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it just didn't, it just it didn't seem like Eleanor's language is the best way that I can put it. Okay, sure. Not no, that we'll it seemed to... out of character, just that again, it seemed to show how much she was now in partnership with Rogers and sharing his perspective. Okay, that her narrative about what she wants is has changed. Without the con, the I... content is the same, but the narrative about the content is different. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, let's keep track of that in the next few episodes. Okay. So the last bit is just. Um, I had a funny question. So right before Rogers leaves, like he has his plan Mm -hmm. of, uh, of him leaving first to try to maybe get teach to follow him and then her leaving the next day to go, to go Mm -hmm. to, to, um, where's she going? She's going to Philadelphia, right? Her family's family's Uh in Boston, but she's going to Philadelphia. When she comes in, he's looking at his own book. I noticed that. Right. Um, just thinking, yeah, I, I wonder if he's just wondering about the man that he is, just questioning right. and doubting the man that he is. That's all I can figure. That's all I can figure, too. But it it seems mm-hmm. so deliberate. I'm just fascinated yeah, by no, that. Like, right. Maybe he was thinking about having lost his brother and yeah. considering losing Eleanor, too. I don't know. It's kind of fascinating because I feel like every other, every other time we've used... Every other time his book has uh, popped up in the story of Black Sails, mm-hmm. it has been used against him. Yes, that's very true. Uh-huh. Right? So it was just, yeah. I don't know, it was just very interesting to have him suddenly referencing the book. I mean, he doesn't, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, I really like their exchange. He tries to use humor to calm her. And then she cries. That was the big emotional thing. Like, have we that ever seen was. Eleanor cry? No. And she, I mean, I was moved by that. They, I like their relationship very much. I'm ready to move on to Flint and Billy and Maddie. Wow. This is a very meaty part of this episode. I was going to say there is just so much. Yeah, there really is. Um, okay. Well, we start with Maddie standing and looking out at the camp uh, Billy comes in on a horse, which I just thought was interesting. Cause which the- was awesome, actually. <laughs> Billy on the horse was really doing it for me. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, I just liked it because the last time I feel like one of them was on a horse was in season one. We had Flint go away on a horse and come back on a horse. Oh, and yeah. Billy's was, so. right? It just Billy seemed- looks somehow more massive on that horse. Yeah, I feel like he looks more massive in this season somehow. In general, yeah. <laughs> Buffed up even more, yeah, which yeah. is crazy. It is crazy. This really struck me, and I kept watching this one part. So Maddie's standing there, right? With her hand on her stomach. With her hand on her stomach. Mm-hmm. Flint comes up and starts talking to her from behind her. Uh huh. When she hears him at first, she shuts her eyes. Like for a good bit, like not just like blinking, but she actually like closes her eyes. Mm -hmm. And it was like, almost like she's in pain. Like, and I can't decide if it's just that she finds Flint so distasteful or that he reminds her of Silver. I just, I couldn't figure out, but it's so striking. Like it's such a deliberate thing that she does, the way she closes her eyes there. That's interesting. Well, she seems to be certainly under a lot of stress i mean she's well the crown is heavy these days especially without silver there yep i am very curious about her holding her stomach if that was just because if it's just showing the stress and her worry and her oh god or you think or if she's pregnant holy shit i didn't even think about that oh really nope i did not think about that that's the first thing i saw when i saw her hand there wow right it's totally a thing And that could have even been, even the eyes closing could have been a wave of nausea. Right. could have had nothing to do with Flint. Huh. Just something to think about. It's possible. Something something to think about. Wow. That would throw a wrench in everything, wouldn't it? (laughs) Yes, it would. It would give her more to stress out about, too. Yep. Yes, that would. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, let's all keep an eye on that. Um, Interesting. (laughs) 
Wow. Um, <laughs> so then Flint brings up and he says, I like how he says this. He says, oh, I, I don't know. I just, I love it when Flint comes into a conversation, you know, he's like so deliberate about what he says and how he says it. Sure. Uh huh. So he says, Billy's plan, your plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then she's like, wait, wait a minute. Is this not your plan too? Right. And, uh huh. And then Gosh, she's so fierce. I just love her. I know. She's so fierce. She's so fierce. Yeah. She's wonderful. Yeah. So <laughs> I know. This is like this is our, our Maddie appreciation moment. I think we'll have more than one in this episode. <laughs> We're gonna have a lot of those in this episode. Yeah. yeah. In every episode, I think. We have a lot of those in every episode. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then he says, I was caught by surprise by your assertion. Uh-huh. And she says, Which we had talked about that too. If yep. you know she could have just said that. Although I did think it was weird that he said that it was something that was difficult or damn near impossible to disprove right which i feel like he, he could can just make her tell him right i thought the same thing I, he could totally make yeah. her tell him where it was yeah it was no but it was difficult to disprove in that moment it's impossible to disprove it to billy oh which is really the weight uh -huh. of it because even if he oh, says, he tell me where she no, she then it's just know. her word against his. And yeah. we know Billy doesn't trust him. That's a really good point. So, okay. I like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah so that clears that up. Right, right, right. Exactly. The only person it needs to be proven to, it doesn't matter if Flint believes her. Right. It only matters if Billy believes her. Oh, that's a good point. Okay. Yep. I got it now. But what's interesting is, so she kind of questions his questioning of her, of her honesty, but then she says, what choice did I have? So I feel mm -hmm. like on some level, she's admitting it. Almost. Yeah. Right? She's, on, again, yeah. doesn't matter. But it's true. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter if she knows or not. Right. Yeah. She could say it's a bold-faced lie and it wouldn't matter because it was enough to change the balance of power between Flint and Billy. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But she makes really good points. So she says, she says, you know, I've seen that his men trust him. I've seen that your men trust him. She says he will be relevant in this, in the way this plays out. Oh, yes. Yeah. And she says, she says he's the one keeping this place together, which right. I really like. That's exactly. my really, I wrote. Uh -huh. Which is true. He definitely well, is doing not that. Not Billy anymore, actually. <laughs> no, not, not quite your Billy, really, at all anymore. Oh. <laughs> and she calls him on this. She says he will be relevant. And yet your first instinct is to dismiss him. Mm -hmm. And she says, who knows how destructive that would have been. Yes. So that's really interesting. She's I mean, of course, so great. she is so great. She mm -hmm. doesn't really know. I mean, well, we don't know how much she knows about the Flint and Billy backstory. I mean, I'm sure Silver has told her stuff. Uh -huh. Casey seemed to tell her stuff. <laughs> yeah, whether or not yeah, he told that's... whether whether or not he told her about the cash, he told her lots of stuff, obviously. Uh huh. That is very true. But it's really yeah, it was I mean it's a great point. It's one of our points, but it's also really interesting with what ends up happening afterwards. I just want a, another moment of Maddie appreciation. I really like uh -huh. the way she like basically just up and walked away from him while she was still talking. She was just oh, like, yeah. she's just like, I'm just going to say my piece and then I'm just going to like really just walk away from you because, because I'm me. <laughs> yes. This yeah. So regal. Um, but yeah, so this, okay, well, let's talk about the Underhills first, but then I do want to talk about what happens at the estate because I feel like she is, you know, figuring out as she goes along, like where she needs to stand here. Oh, um, sure. Yeah. Okay, but we're so we're at first we're introduced to the Underhills. Like we had seen Mr. Underhill and I never had particularly any affection for him uh, up until now. But I really love this little moment we have with the Underhills before they all come in. Um because mm -hmm. it's quite darling, like the little thing with the daughter where the mother's obviously it's sick. Interesting though. I wonder, yeah, why they make that choice to make the mother sick. Oh, I don't know, but I feel like, yeah, I felt my feeling about that. Mo I mean, it's funny. I have, it's such a tiny bit and manages to like pack a lot of emotion in at the same time. 
So you have this kind of darling exchange about their daughter and the like, you know, what does he say? Audrey, are you asleep? And she's like, yes. Yes. Uh huh. <laughs> Which is cute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally adorable. And then the minute we're kind of enchanted with them in this very tiny thing, we immediately mm -hmm. see him ask Ruth to get something for his wife's cough. So, yes. So he asks respectfully, but we're immediately reminded that this lovely family that we've just spent a few seconds with are slaveholders. Are slaveholders. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Right? I just, I don't know. That was just It was like, beautifully done because you're made to feel compassion for him and empathy for him and then reminded of how problematic that situation is. Yeah. Exactly. It, it, In seconds. Yeah. I really yeah. love that. And then the pirates come. And then Flint shoots Underhill. I don't know if we can tell if oh he gosh, killed this him. Is such a vicious pirate raid. This was amazing. <laughs> yes, it is quite amazing. And yeah, then, that was but epic. He, but at the same time, I feel like this is a very deliberate juxtaposition to Flint in the beginning of season three, when he went and killed the magistrate and then just killed oh, the sure. wife. Yes, it did right? remind me of that. Mm -hmm. Right, and he, he did not do that this yes. time. She was holding a gun. He didn't. And he, no. He was like, basically, like, stand down and I won't shoot anymore. Right. And he, and he did look compassionate. He did. Right. Of course. Because he's a very, he's, yeah, he's in a very different place right now. He's not. He is. In the end of season three, the only thing motivating him was vengeance. But he yes. came out mm -hmm. of that with, you know, this larger goal. He has this goal now of this, this mm -hmm. coalition between pirates and enslaved people and this mm -hmm. you know a renewed it's a very different vision than what he started in season one but it's it's something that does have ideals yes he does yeah. have an ideal now he does have a you know whether it's realistic or not is a different is a different conversation <laughs> fair uh-huh but i think that he has something that he believes in again he believes that he's doing something that's right yeah mm. Which is dangerous, but it is dangerous. <laughs> uh, always a dangerous thing in the mind yeah. of, you know, our friend James. Mm -hmm. But um, I do love also that Ruth was the one who took the gun away from Mrs. Underhill. And she yeah, did gently. Yeah, there for a second, I thought she was just going to shoot her in the head. Yes, did you so did that? I. Yep. yep. Okay. So did yep. I. So did I. But I, I love Ruth. I mean, we have Ruth for so short. I love Ruth. Yeah, but she was great. Yeah. And that great line, I'm glad that you came and now I need you to go. Oh. I had just, three question marks by it. I was like, what are you even talking about? Oh, that just killed me, right? Because you're so oh. psyched. You're like, oh, they've come and yeah. they're going to free the slaves on the Underhill estate. And this is great. They're doing that thing that we mm -hmm. wanted them to do. Like we're actually watching it happen. The thing that Flint right. just talked about in season three. And yet the brutality of civilization is such yes. oh, that the geez. estates split up the families. I mean, this... This is such, it's funny, I don't feel like I ever read specifically, I mean, obviously, slave, enslaved families were separated and brutally not at all considered as family right. units that needed to be respected as such. Horrible. I don't feel mm -hmm. like I read ever a history of this specifically done, but I would, I mean, this seems so believable to me that a group oh, uh -huh. of plantation owners would do exactly such a thing yes. to enforce peace and to, right. And to, to, to inhibit the ability to have a rebellion. Oh, oh I it's, like that. Enforce peace. Ugh. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> when you enslave people, that's the only peace you get. Yes. Oh gosh. It's so awful. It is so awful. And I just felt like this was such a, such a subtle and, and powerful way to show that. Like it would just, I just feel like it was, again, I think all, all depictions of slavery are important for us to always be reminded of. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like this was very different than, than depictions we've had in a lot of, of television and movies of slavery. And and so powerful in its subtlety, mm -hmm. like the idea, I mean, it's just so clear, the brutality, even without seeing actual brutality, right. but the brutality mm -hmm. of this threat is so uh. strong. Of course, I mean, this is, this is where, like, we have this triangle, right, of Flint and Billy and Maddie. 
and Maddie had put herself between Flint and Billy in a way to empower Billy because what she saw as Billy's potential. But this so solidified how Flint and Maddie are actually mm -hmm. the people in alignment with each other. Yes. Yeah, it certainly did. Um, so yeah, let's talk about this. So Billy comes in and he's like, oh, cool, we found a storehouse. But bizarrely, the slave quarters were locked from within. Mm -hmm. And so Maddie, that's when Maddie explains this diabolical right. plan. Uh, and it then, is diabolical. Uh, and um, And then Billy is just talking about his men. So I feel like... This is yeah. Billy, right? This is Billy. This is what Billy right. has always been. Billy is about his men. He's like, I lost six men. We need this food. You know, I need this base and this storehouse in right. order it's for- It's very short-sighted though. Right, exactly, right? It's so mm -hmm. short-sighted. And I feel like this is an interesting thing. It's like, we were so psyched about Billy the leader and Billy the storyteller and yeah. Billy, Billy inhabiting this new space of being a leader. Right. But this is kind of the wall he just butted up against. This is the place. Well, where and it, does, it reminds me of when Flint says, you are new to this, to Silver. Right, right, right. Like you don't understand that there is a limit to these powers and also the weight that it puts on you. Exactly. And also that the more the men need you, the more you need them. Like Billy is going through all of that right now. And he doesn't have he a mentor at all. No, he, that's true. He does not have a mentor because the only thing close to that would have been Flint. And boy, but, he's like an anti-mentor. That's true. Well, and he did have <laughs> Gates, but... Yeah, but Gates was never that kind of leader. Gates was a right-hand man. He was not a leader. Oh, you're right about that. That's a good call. Yeah, good point. Um, and that's the thing. I mean, I think this is an argument that, that Billy is a great right-hand man. Mm -hmm. He's really good at like taking care of his people and stuff, but he's not... He's not the visionary. Again, you can also argue the vision is insane, right? Maddie and Flint are have have agreed on this large vision. And Maddie articulates it beautifully. I mean, she says yeah. you can't take all of the you can't take all of the, the plantations at the same time. Therefore, we must go take Nassau. Because the only <sighs> way the only yeah. way to free the enslaved people is through mm -hmm. a revolt happening in all of the places at once. Which won't right. happen which... unless they know that they have somewhere to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And although the idea is really exciting and epic. Sure. Absolutely. No question. Yeah. No, no. I'm Love really the idea. excited about seeing that unfold. I hope right. that it does. I hope, I hope, well, again, we. Again, history. History. Yeah. <laughs> I know it doesn't work out for NASA and the pirates. I know. I know. History, history is staring at you right now, Liz. <laughs> Yes. History has its eye on me. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. History has its eye on Liz and her in her high hopes for the pirates. Which are all of our <laughs> high hopes for the pirates. I mean it's again, it's I that's what I love about this scene. It's just like okay, when Billy says later, this is after they've left, but he says mm -hmm. I'm through following you down a path only you can see toward a victory only right. you can define. He's kind of the person speaking sense here, right? Like, that's true. But yeah, but again, short sighted. Uh -huh. Right. On the flip side, when he says only you can see this path, Maddie sees this path. She sees the same path. It's true. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, because Flint and Maddie are so much aligned. And it's, I mean, and not. I mean, I just, I just saw there's so much tension in these alignments. Well, sure. I really enjoy it. That's true. It's, I mean, it's and they've brilliant. been waiting and they've been pitting Billy against Flint. But I was not ready for this, like, like this, the way that <laughs> the, it unfolded action, as quickly the, as it did. Yes, yeah. it does. Yes, it does. That powder keg explosion that I was not ready for. I was not expecting. Right. And I'm, yeah. Mm. You also didn't watch the previews. Everyone who watched the previews saw. Oh, didn't, yeah. Didn't, didn't, didn't necessarily know how quickly this was going to happen. In the previews, you see Billy right. and Flint like standing against each other with two lines. Oh. And everyone freaked out about that. And I was just like, well, guys. yeah, I sure did when I saw it. Yeah, but I was like, guys, Treasure Island. <laughs> no, I know. Like, I knew I, I, we talked about that when we did right. our wrap up and, yep. and our predictions. Like, I knew that he was going to be pitted against Silver and Flint somehow, but I wasn't expecting it so quickly in just episode two. And so epically, right, with firing 
I mean, oh, right. Well, and and what an interesting fight between the two of them. What what an interesting thing that like you know who would I mean I remember you've talked about like different people pitted against Billy in a fight or pitted against Vane, but it's like Flint's tiny. Yeah. Flint's tiny, but he's so scrappy. Like he really he's held his own. Just, yeah, he can hold his own. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Yes, he is. Um, I mean, again, I never doubted when I mean, we saw Flint kill Singleton. So it's not like mm-hmm. it's not like we weren't already introduced the idea that Flint could win a fight against a man much larger than himself. Right. Again, this goes to what I said in C- in the first episode of this season. Flint is scrappy. I'm just curious now, like what is the, like the scrappy factor of our different of our different characters? <laughs> The scrappy factor. Uh-huh. <laughs> like we know, we know Jack high on scrappy. Sure, <laughs> okay, absolutely. Okay, that, that mm-hmm. came out really weird. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> but yeah, Flint has a high level of scrappy as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I just yeah, I don't know. I feel like I feel like there's more to be said about this than what I've managed to say, but it just. I just feel like this was the moment where all of the all of the flintness of Flint and all of the billiness of Billy just finally butt up against each other. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Like, yeah, you said that already. Like they've they've kind of hinted at this conflict the whole time. But now it really came down to it. And because Billy has become a leader of men as well. I think that's the difference. It's like suddenly, he certainly like, has. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and Maddie was right. He's earned the respect so much of all of those men there. Right. But I get in keeping their respect, especially for something like the salt pork and the corn. But right. he was willing to, to again, to lose the war for the to, to win the battle. Exactly. That's well, not and to great. save some men. I mean, that's this is right. this goes his men. Yeah, his men. Well, and he could save so many more going with this plan but he is sentimental in that way he has his men and everybody else exactly that's the difference is that flint and maddie are fighting the war for for all sorts of people they don't even know Mm -hmm. whereas billy is very focused on his band of brothers like his group of people that's very true yeah so right so there's just a provincialism still in what billy's vision is sure Maybe maybe the show's arguing that that the that sort of provi- provincialism is mm-hmm. actually the right way to go. We don't know. We're, again, we know mm-hmm. we know the plan's doomed. <laughs> yes. So, so maybe maybe Billy's approach ultimately will prove to be a better approach. <laughs> it's not as inspiring, and it certainly isn't going to free all the slaves on New Providence Island. Right. And I'm just not sure Billy cares about that. I'm not sure if that's. I mean, again, ooh. Billy, see, this goes to what Andrew was talking about, like, Billy, son of levelers, like, he should actually be a person who, like, cares about, like, the rights of people in general. He should. Yeah. Maybe he has stepped away from that idealism that his Mm -hmm. parents taught him. It it seems like it to me. I mean, this is not the Billy I knew. Right. Which isn't to say I don't believe the character arc, because I do. No, I totally believe it. He's stepping very far from who we met in the beginning huh oh that's interesting right because if right billy the son of levelers who who was pressed into service handing out pamphlets should actually be the person who is trying to free enslaved people all over the island if not all over the colonies Mm -hmm. oh all right yeah this is going to be an interesting season of finding out who who Billy has become and who he is becoming. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I know. (laughs) It it does seem, it does seem like the power is going to his head. Do you, I mean, I don't know if that, do you think that's true? I'm not sure if that's what's motivating him. I think that he just, I think that he might, his vision just might not be large enough because he's so focused on the men in front of his face. Well, and that's true, but and, and maybe that's what I mean by power. Maybe not power, mm-hmm. but influence. Mm-hmm. The the mm-hmm. fact that Res- and responsibility and responsibility. To, I suppose that's what I mean to say. Like like mm-hmm. the responsibility to the men has clouded his greater vision. Right, might be a better way of saying it. Right. Well, and this is always, but this has always been a difference between him and Flint. Like Flint is willing to sacrifice individuals for mm-hmm. the sake of the larger cause, and Billy has always had a problem with that. Yeah. 
Hmm. So Billy is not a man. I mean, he sees he sees the larger cause as a path only Flint can see. Right. And perhaps that's just because Billy can't see it. I like that very much. Yeah. I it's I mean, it's just hard because he's holding at such great value the lives of these what six men that he lost that night and he might mm-hmm. lose more. Right. Compared to how many slaves on that plantation alone, right. let alone seven exactly. plantations. Oh no. I agree with you. Oh, I'm mm. I am firmly on the side of Flint and Maddie in this argument. Yeah, of course. Mm. Of course. All right. Well, let's move on to another threesome that are at conflict about uh-huh. what their goals and values are. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> See where this is going. Uh, yes. Let's move to the revenge and discuss Jack and Anne and Teach. And mm-hmm. I think I already said this, but I feel like I need to say this again. Oh, my God. This series of conversations. <sighs> Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's get into it. I'm super excited. Sure. I've been super excited to talk about this. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. You love this, this <sighs> particular trifecta. Uh-huh. I do. I or love this trifecta. Tri- right. Say. Mm-hmm. I, yes. I, what, however we're going to call it. I love these Whatever. three people. <laughs> Already. I love them. Mm-hmm. This, um, yeah, this episode for the three of them is so moving to me. Also, I wanted to mention, um, after after we recorded with Toby, he and I had a little chat about the about this episode, and I just wanted to say uh, we've not mentioned him before, but um, the director of this episode is Alex Sakharov, and uh-huh. he has directed a bunch of episodes. And I meant to look them all up, and I didn't. I know that he did the season finale of season three, and oh uh, wow, yeah. And yeah, and I wanted to say that um, the thing that really struck me that Toby said was that he, you know, despite whatever like scheduling issues they had, mm-hmm. he really always made a point of giving the actors kind of the space and time they needed to to kind of go really deep into their scenes. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. He said that Alex Akarov's uh, <laughs> favorite direction is go deeper. That he would have oh, the actors like, like do a scene a and then just say go deeper. And that yeah. um, Toby felt like he really kind of gave them the environment that really let them like find places that they hadn't found before. Yeah. And I feel like that if you, even if you just take 310 and this episode alone, I feel Mm -hmm. like you really see the evidence of that in these smaller conversations that are so powerful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just, I just wanted to say that because I just, uh, again, I really like this. I really like this part of this episode. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. So we start with, um, after they sent the message with all of the hanging red coats. Right. Uh, they're talking about that. And Jack says he won't turn her over, not for 60 men, not for 600 men. Mm-hmm. And Teach was like, yeah, well, we don't really have the stores to like, to like do this. Right. To do this. Black so like basically Teach is kind of saying like, that was never the point. Yes. Right. Like he's pretty much mm-hmm. saying like, yeah, I never thought he was going to hand Ele- Eleanor over. That's not why I did this. And um, and then he tells Anne to go to the west western side of the island because he wants them to go basically like go grab Eleanor. Right. Yeah. Right. And then Anne says, oh, the western side is no good. She gets a full on teach glare for it. Like, I oh, do really, you think it was a glare? Oh, yeah, it was definitely a glare. I would I would actually love to just have like a few minutes of just like Anne and teach doing a glare off. <laughs> 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 but he, he respected her, though. He really respected the idea. And even before Jack well, got the affirmation right. out of his mouth that he agreed, yeah, but he Jack told did her a to quick, go ahead and do it. Well, no, Jack did his little save first. Jack said, oh, no, no, the lagoon's better. Like they were glaring and Jack like stepped in from the side to say, no, no, the lagoon, la- the lagoon's better. And that's when Teach uh-huh. said, that's when Teach was like, fine, do it. Hmm. So like no no Jack saved that situation. Teach was not satisfied with Anne's response to his to his idea. Oh, I see. I misread that then. That's very interesting. That's how I see it. And Jack's face looked so. What was his face to Anne then? Because to me, I just thought that he was looking disappointed that Teach was starting to respect Anne oh. more than him. No, I think he's worried about Anne. I think that this is this. Her. I think we've stepped into the middle of of like because we already had this last episode where mm-hmm. remember where Anne also a little bit balked when Teach was allowing 
the the red coats to board the ship and he's mm-hmm. like i thought i thought you were the i thought you were the fearless one right so i think so i feel like we've okay. already you know we've stepped into a situation where we've already had teach and Anne a little bit like brushing up against each other sure. and jack's trying to protect Anne. okay all right and that makes their following conversation make more sense so okay. right so that's how i that's how i see what happened here uh-huh. i did want to just make the note that like once Jack said that and Teach said, do it, he just walked away. Like, so this is, I just felt like a really, really lovely moment of showing the difference again between Teach and Teach and Mm -hmm. Flint. Like Flint would be Uh like super micromanaging how all of this was done. And Teach is like, do it. Do it. And then just leaves. Yeah. Make it so. Right. Exactly. (laughs) Even though we did actually have the make it so moment, literally from Flint. Billy, Billy, make it so. so. (laughs) But that um, was after very precise direction too. So. Exactly right, right, right. We 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 know our man Flint. He's not so we good do. at the like at the at the delegating. Not at all. <laughs> Teach, on the other hand, just like do the shit. I got. I got. I'll be at my right. cabin. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, right. So then we have the next scene where where Jack more lays and out the one that confused me. You'll have to help okay. me with this one, but I okay. think it's because God, I again, I, I was confused because it, I had misread that earlier scene as sure. Teach respecting Anne and uh, and valuing her opinion. And if it wasn't that, then that's already going to make a little more sense. So right. why don't you I go ahead and walk teach, me through that? I think Teach is pretty pissed off at Anne. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that makes more sense now. So yeah, I love when Jack's like Teach wants to know, and then he's like in the middle of his own sentence, he's like, "You have no intention of going there." <laughs> Mm-hmm. he already he knew he didn't even have to start that he already knew that right. Anne wasn't going to do it again I feel like there's some really great moment like great twin moments here to like bring mm-hmm. up what we said about the what we said ages ago about about her being able to read between the lines of his message and that what John explicitly right. said to us about them being twins there's just like there's just a whole lot of the two of them understanding each other without talking in this episode mm-hmm. and I really like it so uh, she just, yeah, this is where Anne breaks my heart because she says why she's not going to go. She's like, if I go looking mm-hmm. for Eleanor, I'm going to find her. Yes. Ah, oh, God, I love it so much. Yeah, there's just a few lines here that just, yeah, dagger into heart and then deeper and then deeper and then deeper. <laughs> um, and she says, it's not just the, the lie. It's that she tried to take you away from me. Mm-hmm. <gasps> That surprised me, actually. I mean, that's not what Max was trying to do, but that's how no. Ma- that's how Anne perceives what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, oh. You know, Max made her a promise, and that promise was broken. Mm-hmm. And whatever. I mean, ultimately, Max is responsible for making a promise and having it broken, even though it wasn't right. her who broke it. Mm. But the part that I love so much and the part that just makes my heart sore for Anne is that she said, I don't want to do it. I don't, she's, she, I don't want revenge. Like in this yeah. scene, in this episode about people who want revenge and doesn't want revenge. She said, I don't want to live with it after the sight of her hurt in that way. Yeah. And she means the sight of me having hurt her in that way. Yes. But she's, yes. But oh my God, what maturity, like, Anne, I love you. Is Anne now the most mature person in the whole in the whole show? Oh, she might be. I don't know. Does that make it maturity necessarily? It's such maturity. That is such maturity to understand what she would do and know that she doesn't want to do it. And this thing that motivates so oh, many of okay. our characters. Uh-huh. So many of our characters are motivated by by revenge. Mm-hmm. And think about think about Anne in there season one. There was a lot one. of thought about that in this episode yeah that's very interesting i just feel like aunt this is aunt's just like she doesn't talk a lot but she's just the smartest person again it's a different kind of smart than max is smart or mm-hmm. silver is smart sure but like but like deep down who's the smartest person in this episode in my eyes it's Anne because she might be the that's only so person who actually okay. understands what she's about she understands herself she understands what she would do and that she doesn't want to do it. And then she makes choices mm-hmm. based on that, knowing 
that she doesn't want to put herself in a place where she would do something she doesn't want to do. That's such maturity. Okay. All right. I love this. I love this so I'm, much. No, I'm so glad. I I still struggle with understanding Anne all the time. So, mm-hmm. and I love that she speaks so much to you. I just, I, I, I don't quite follow her. <laughs> That's so funny. There have been times where she speaks so much to you. <laughs> That's true. Early on. Right? Uh, yeah, there. Um, During her metamorphosis. Her metamorphosis. Right. Yeah, her metamorphosis is season two for sure. But she but speaks since to me. Then I've had trouble oh, understanding this... who she became. Oh, like I understood funny. the transition, but now where she's landed has been harder for me. Oh, that's so interesting. Where she's landed, like, s- makes so much sense to me. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Post metamorphosis and like totally clicks for me. I love it. Fascinating. Okay. Well, that's another com- That's a conversation for like Daphne and Liz to have about Daphne and Liz, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> separate, day, yes. separate from black sales. Um, for sure. <laughs> and then she says the thing that, again, if we were doing a thesis statement, I would argue is the thesis statement. She says mm-hmm. that fucking island, it makes you do shit you don't right. want to do. Mm-hmm. I love that. I'm cu- like, where do we, what do we think about that statement? That's such an interesting statement. Is it true? I mean, I think it's true for Anne. Is it true for all of them? Like, what an interesting idea. This this place that we've held up as a utopia, that we've we've seen Nassau, or I guess New Providence Island, because she's talking about the island, but mm-hmm. we've seen it as so many things. I feel like this is a new, this is a new idea of what it mm-hmm. is. And is it true? Do we feel like it's a place that inspires or compels people to do what they don't want to do? I don't know if we need to answer that right now. I mean, maybe this is, yeah, this is how we're supposed more about to. That, it's more of that mythic quality when we were mm-hmm. talking about like like the, the mythos that's become such a big part of black sales. I mean, this, I, I just, I, I, I will bring this up This is up more again. what, uh, wasn't Andrew comparing things to Lost? Yes, which I've never seen. <laughs> oh, you've never seen Lost? Yeah. I've never seen Lost. Well, that's the, the, this idea of like the island having a mind of its own almost. I will compare to The Godfather. You can compare to Lost. <laughs> <laughs> what little I remember from the show. Right. I will compare to Deadwood. You can compare to... Um... Fair enough. Okay, we've both seen Firefly. But, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but you're podcasting about it, so that's different. It's true. I, I love this statement. I feel like it maybe is true for Anne. I'm uh-huh. curious how much this is true for characters in general. And I just... I want to... I want to keep this in mind when we watch the rest mm-hmm. of this season because I feel like it's very significant. Okay. Okay. So next, my favorite. I uh, see. It's not even my. Fa- I don't even know if I want to call say, it my favorite. Saying. <laughs> I don't know if I want to call it my favorite conversation of this episode because there's two conversations this episode that are so unbelievably amazing. Mm-hmm. This is one of them. Yes. Okay. So Jack comes in to talk to Teach, and mm-hmm. he first offers up. He says, "Look." If you need this thing to happen, I will make it happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he says, do you want to know what I think? And then he doesn't wait for an answer. No, he doesn't. Which I thought was. was He knows Teach. Was Teach going to give him an answer? It's (laughs) true. Yeah. Realistically. It's a favorable one if he did. Yes. (laughs) And then, ah, yeah, I love this. Okay. So he quotes Anne. This is really wonderful. It's so beautiful. So he quotes Anne from last episode where he says, only a fool gives his life to earn the admiration of a corpse. And then he makes that beautiful parallel to Vain. Yes. Well, and I love this idea of honoring Vain, or really just honoring the dead in general, but particularly mm-hmm. honoring Vain for who he was and his virtues by upholding those virtues mm-hmm. and not Jack's own or Teach's own. Oh. And it really shows how much Jack has learned because that's one of the things during Anne's metamorphosis that I talked about mm-hmm. when he was loving her as he decided she needed to be loved instead of as she decided. Right. And this is this is showing how he learned from that experience to respect Vane in the way that he would have wanted to be respected rather than the way that came naturally to Jack. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. I mean, and we've had so much of that. We've had, we had that also with Vane, that he was loving Eleanor for the vision he yes, had imposed on absolutely. her. Huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I love that way of looking at it. And then we find, I mean, it's funny, as much as we've had this idea of this, uh, of the, 
intrinsic difference between Jack and Teach. The place, mm -hmm. the place that they are, that they have a commonality is sentimentality. So Jack compares Anne to Vane and says that she has the same mistrust of sentimentality. And I love that the minute he says that, Teach just goes into possibly the most sentimental story we've had yet in all of Black mm -hmm. Sails. I love this story. I love this story for it's itself. It's a beautiful story. The story right? for itself is good. And then the act, the storytelling behind it is, is really fantastic. Right. And it's just like, Teach is like, let me tell you a story about how sentimental I am. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Which we always knew. I mean, Teach has always been very sentimental. The way he talks about his wives uh, exactly. has, has really exactly. shown that. The way yeah. he talked in the very beginning about NASA as he remembered it. I mean, this is just what he does. Um, but I love that because he starts this story talking about how when he met Vane, he saw how similar they were. And yes. then launches into the story that basically shows how incredibly different they are. Yes. The teach sees this bird and he's like, what is the meaning of this bird? There is this meaning. But, and and there it was is this meaning. Like an albatross, right? A giant white bird. It had to be an albatross, didn't it? Oh. I took uh, the note and then forgot to go looking back on it. But when he said that other countries right. and in the East see it as right. um, like a portent or, or a harbinger of, of, of evil. Right. Yes. A bad, a bad, a bad omen. Yeah. Right. A bad omen. Basically. Right. Yeah. Maybe think oh. it was an albatross, but I'm not sure. Oh, that's funny. It had to I, be, right? I, 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 as massive be, as it was? To be honest, I didn't think about what kind of bird it was. I just was like involved in like the storytelling. But sure. Oh, yeah. I, well, and, and because of all of the tie-ins that we know with Moby Dick, I suppose, because the creators did. So it just came right to my mind. I could be wrong. You probably are right. I just didn't bother to think about that part of it. I was thinking more <laughs> about the emotional aspect of the story not about the specifics of the bird but knowing knowing what we know of this show i'm sure the type of bird right. is very significant sure i just i just didn't i just didn't think to think about that part. <laughs> <laughs> so yes i just love this that yeah it was just basically like Jack's like, hey, yo, you know, we are sentimental and Anne is kind of like vain in this, you know, distrust, mm -hmm. mistrust of sentimentality and teaches like, oh, yeah, I'm really I'm really sentimental, too. Let me tell you the story about how sentimental I can be and how vain like says when I say, what does this bird mean to you? And Vane's like dinner, <laughs> <laughs> which is perfect. It's classic Charles. I love that it makes Jack oh. laugh. I love it so much. They kind of share a moment remembering. They totally Carlton. share a moment. They totally they share a moment. And and again, I, I'm hoping that this is, as much as I adore when their differences are exposed through their interactions, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much I was going to love watching their similarities be exposed through an interaction. It's true. Yeah. Right? And I've been waiting for a moment like this between Jack and Teach. We needed it, I think. <sighs> And it's great that, of course, it was um, so gorgeous. Yeah, so that it was gorgeous. the memory of Charles and something so beautiful. Something dinner. so beautiful. I know. <laughs> I know. You just hear Vane saying that, right? Right. Best punchline ever. Uh, yes. Pretty fantastic. <laughs> well, right. And the and the and the moment is beautiful in of itself, but it's also beautiful in how it propels the story, because mm -hmm. Jack immediately brings this to thinking about what Vane would want. And he says, I, I keep thinking, would it please him what we want to do? It's funny. Yeah. Like he just said, like, I pretty much like Anne has convinced me I should stop thinking about pleasing a corpse. Right. And then he's like, yeah, but I'm actually going to bring that up now. <laughs> I'm actually going to talk <laughs> about what that corpse would want from us. Because <laughs> he can't help himself. But it's um, true. It's true. <laughs> But he says, like, does he still, you know, after all they've done to each other, does he still just a little bit love her? But then he says the thing that, you know, really is true. It's like, would he want revenge in his name or for us to defeat the governor and win this war? Like we mm -hmm. saw, we saw, they, neither of them saw this. We saw Vane sacrifice himself for right. the sake of this war. Mm -hmm. We saw how... How much, how deliberately he did that. Right. Yeah. No, I think it was, it was obvious. And, and Jack said so that as soon as you give it just a few moments thought, you're going to know 
what Vane would have wanted. Right. But it's a hard thing to do because um, we keep talking about that in these episodes too, that that strong emotions cloud your judgment. Absolutely. And that idea of of darkness, especially moving mm-hmm. you forward and, and, and cloaking itself and whatever it must to compel you to action. Right. Is there a darker emo- emotion than vengeance? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Not that I can think of. Yeah, right, right off the hand, right off hand anyway. Right? Yeah. But that was, for me, this was the conversation that was so moving to me. Like the one with Anne, I didn't quite understand as well talking about Max, but this mm-hmm. one was very moving to me. And yet, but this was inspired by, by all the things that Anne said. Yeah. The two of them were so... That is so very true. Jack and Teach were both so determined and so, I think, convinced... Mm-hmm that their vengeance was the righteous path. Yeah. And it took Anne to convince them otherwise. That is true. I love the idea of Anne being a kind of proxy mouthpiece for Vane. Yeah. Although it's not what she meant to do at all. But, no. But yes. Yeah. But, that, but that's the effect she really had on... Right. But it's the effect mm-hmm. she had on, on, on Jack because she is so similar to Vane. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Right. And now I just love, I love a million times more like the choice that Clara made that, 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 um, that Lauren told us that Clara made the choice to like do her hair in 310 to be more like vain. Like I love. Oh, right. Yes. Uh huh. I love that we are already having these kind of hints at, at Anne perhaps. Mm -hmm possibly inhabiting this role or maybe had always inhabited this role to some extent for Jack. Like I also love what Toby said that, that, that perhaps Vane and, Anne were attracted to Jack for the same reasons, like for this wild sure. unpredictability he had mm-hmm. because the two of them had so much in common. Right. It, it seems like the only difference was that Vane had kind of, kind of knew who he was from the beginning of when we saw him. Whereas Anne has only just now, Kind sure stepped into that place of self uh-huh. self understanding i like all of this i also yeah. love i also love the the thing i didn't write down i guess the thing i didn't bring up is that i love that we've had in season 2 especially we had these parallels between anne and flint of metamorphosis and oh sure the, yes okay yeah right? absolutely uh-huh so i love the idea that now we have the thing in the show about parallels, like there are a lot of moments where characters parallel. And I think I may have said this already. So excuse me, everyone, if I've already explained what delights me about this. Mm-hmm. There are moments when characters have parallels to each other that I feel like are very, very clearly drawn. And I think what's most interesting about these moments of being of having parallels is the moment where the two characters diverge. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it ends up accentuating the aspects of them that are different and so i feel like you know Anne and flint we had some really clear parallels with them but this vengeance thing Mm -hmm. i mean flint has to some extent he has a new goal so his goal isn't vengeance but it is still kind of vengeance i mean flint's (laughs) it's always going to be yeah yeah, exactly Mm -hmm. right but Anne has stepped away from vengeance I mean, Anne had moments of vengeance, like she, you know, she killed the ranger, the remnants of the ranger crew. Right. Totally she vengeance. Uh-huh. Right. Mm-hmm. She's had moments of vengeance, but to see her now so clearly step away from that motivation. Right. As someone who has been very clearly in parallel with Flint in the past, I just feel like that makes it all the more poignant as a message about, you know, maybe vengeance is kind of a crappy motivator. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. All righty. Are you ready to move on to Silver and Israel Hands? I am. Although I did want to say first that I also really appreciated how much we saw, how much Teach really did love Vane oh, when he talked about that. Absolutely. Fated to mean something to one another or fated to be important to one another. That was... Beautiful. It was really right. lovely. Yes. It was a beautiful scene. It was a beautiful, it, it's a beautiful scene. It is just a yeah. beautiful scene. I, I, yeah, forever, I'm forever going to love that scene. That's a scene I, mm-hmm. I see myself watching many, oh, many sure. times yeah, and just definitely. always, always being moved by its, its one beauty. of the best. I agree. Yeah. yeah by its beauty. Mm-hmm. It really, it's just so beautiful. 
Yeah. Speaking of, if we're going to Silver and Israel Hand, this opening was gorgeous. I know, right? Wasn't it beautiful? Just haunting. And those ships, like the the wrecks, like ghost ships. Oh, it was beautiful. Seeing the wrecks from the distance. Like we have been Mm -hmm. in this, we've been in this location before. And I am going to actually bring that up specifically in relation uh to this. But yes, yeah, seeing the wrecks from a distance, I'm I'm now amused because I think back in one in the second episode of season one, uh-huh. I thought they had said rocks, and you were like, no, I think they said wrecks, and so I was right. amused when yes. I saw when I saw from but a distance. I was like, see. it was so dark, we didn't see the ships right. then. We just saw right. so could well have been well, the rocks, yeah. And we were in there, so we didn't really see it from a distance. But when you see it from a distance, right. it's like, yeah, this is wrecks, definitely, definitely wrecks. wrecks. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so the, the first time I watched it, I was like, okay. Liz, you are 100% right. They were totally <laughs> saying wrecks. There are wreck uh-huh. ships there. <laughs> so I guess we have our answer for friend or foe, huh? Oh, you do Although we? It's I kind mean, of complicated now. It's very complicated, right? Ooh. We have a I'm still going to say he turned out to be a foe. He turned oh. out to be a foe, and then Silver won him over. Right. Yes, right. That's yeah. that's how I see it. Yes, foe yes. who becomes yes. friend. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. And just a quick note to everyone: like we didn't get your answers before this episode, so we're going to be giving you it's your true. pirate names. Yes, we'll have to wait a bit when on we that. cover yeah. when we cover the third episode. Okay. Uh, right, friend or foe? Hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's complex. It's complicated. Is the answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so we get over to. The wrecks. I loved the idea of of uh, Israel Hands living in the wrecks as kind oh, of a uh-huh. wrecked person. Like I just feel right. like, yeah, it's like his native habitat for the state that he's in. And I'm yeah. curious. And it's again very mythic, <laughs> super mythic. Yes. Okay, so let me just talk about Israel Hands for a second before sure. we get into this. Israel Hands, for those who don't know, is actually both a historic pirate and a treasure island character mm-hmm. okay so he is a super special person mm-hmm. and i adore that they used him i guess we'll have to put on our list of questions for john like was he always in the was he always in the plans mm-hmm. it's hard for me to imagine that he wasn't as someone who is actually the only bridge yeah. Between our historic pirates and our fictional pirates, mm, because he's both. Yeah. Now, the historic pirate and the fictional pirate are different. The historic pirate mm-hmm. was, in fact, teaches right hand man. Oh, the, okay, yeah. The fictional pirate is Silver's right hand man. <gasps> I remember that now. Yes. Oh, that is interesting. Okay. I I love that Robert Louis Stevenson, like, he mentions other pirates, like other Mm -hmm. historical pirates in Treasure Island, but this is the only one that became a character in the story. Wow. That is so interesting. Okay. So neat. I love it. Okay. I love love this so much. Clearly. <laughs> yes, I'm super delighted by the fact that he was included here. And I'm going to assume that he's going to be pretty important in this season. Right. For that so, reason. Yes. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. Um, the other slightly more like crazy theorizing mm-hmm. side of what I wanted to bring up, because this is what I'm going to do now in season four, because I don't know what the rest of the season looks like. So I'm just going to uh-huh. bring up crazy shit every episode and just hope that some of it actually might have something to do with anything or not. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, we'll have to maybe I'll have to like do a tally at the end of like crazy shit I brought up <laughs> that that panned out or didn't pan out. Yes. Yeah. You have to take good notes. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to bring up. I don't know what this might mean, but Uh I did want to bring up going back to episode one and our discussion of Jacob and Esau. I wanted to remind everyone that when Jacob wrestles with the angel. Yes. Mm -hmm. He becomes Israel. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I don't know what this means here. I'm not trying to say that Israel hands is Jacob because I really do like the idea of silver as Jacob. 
Yes. Uh huh. I just think that this might be too much sure. of a coincidence to be a yeah. coincidence. Interesting. Okay. So let's again. Now I just brought up crazy back theory. Pocket. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will stick that in my back pocket, and who knows what I'll do with it? Maybe I'll pretend I never said it. <laughs> maybe, maybe a few episodes from now, I'll be super like, look at me with the smart ideas. Right. Sure. Sure. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows where that's going to go? But mm -hmm. I just, I just found it interesting, the choice of Jacob and Esau as our allusion to different groups yeah. of people. And then a character. And then Israel. Named, yeah. Named Israel. That's very interesting. Yep. Okay. So yeah, I have nothing more to say about that because I don't know how that would pan out, but I yeah. just wanted to bring it up. Mm -hmm. Andrew Dice, that one was for you. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the actual interactions they have now that now that I've given sure. like a, a yeah lot. after the gorgeous dragging across the sand. Right. Um, I've seen you before. You was long. I really liked. I know. I love that line. too. Yeah. What a great way to talk about silver uh -huh. again. Like kind of talking about mythic silver, mm -hmm. kind of dismissing myth yes, silver at the same absolutely. time yeah. which i feel like the beginning was doing i feel like the beginning was kind of a continuation of what i said about 401 is that you know all these people are investing all of this power in the idea of silver the story of silver mm -hmm. and what we're confronted with is like super vulnerable silver mm, so in the beginning yeah. he's super vulnerable in the first scene sure. like he's being dragged he's chained He's mm -hmm. really quite freaked out by when yeah, when Israel when Israel slits the throat of the red coat. He's super scared. Which, boy, that was some gross foley work. <laughs> right? Yeah. That was some juicy throat slicing. Yeah. Thanks for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you listen to this one with headphones again? I did listen to this yeah, one with this, headphones again. This is cool. one of those moments like I feel like ninety nine percent of the time I'm super happy that I listened with headphones, and then uh -huh. there's a moment where that where I'm like, oh, uh, could have done without that actually. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Like, yes, yes, that is a moment I could have experienced without headphones and mm -hmm. been really just happy with the rest of my life. Sure. Um, but yeah, I really, really like that. I also wanted to bring up the last time we had Silver at the Rex. This is what I meant about bringing up the second episode of season one. Mm -hmm. Remember, you know, Silver is like, he's got his whole scheme for like right. giving them the um, schedule and getting the pearls. And he's, remember, mm -hmm. he's hiding, he's hiding and he sends like these like poor lepers or just like random homeless dudes to try to get the pearls and mm -hmm. Vane just keeps stabbing them. Oh, right? yes. Yes. Remember that? Yes. I where, do remember that. Where Jack's oh like, where yeah. Jack's like right Ooh, maybe he's outsmarted us and Vane's like, yeah, he hasn't outsmarted us. Stab. Yep. <laughs> so Gosh, I just, I love Vane. Uh -huh. I, I know I miss Vane. Should we, should we uh -huh. cheers? Let's raise cheers. a glass to Vane, cheers. even though we've done it before. Raise a glass uh, to Vane. Cool. We, we miss you terribly, Charles, Chaz. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring up the fact that like suddenly we're back in that same location with Silver and we're kind mm -hmm. of have that same juxtaposition of like a sneaky smart dude and like a guy who's just willing to slit someone's throat for yes. 500 pieces. Yeah. So I just found that yeah. interesting. I felt like this was like some sort of interesting callback to like Silver's last experience. Sure. <laughs> in yeah. Same but both of them take this in a direction where, you know, where it's not that simple. What did you think of having him write the note? Oh, uh, why does Israel Hands want him to write the note? Well, no, it, it wasn't that that struck me so much as we've already had these notes of these threatening letters sent by mm -hmm. Long John Silver. Mm -hmm. but Billy wrote them. Right. So I feel like this is going to be obviously different. <laughs> it's going to be different in style. Right. It's going to be different in rhetoric. Right. It's going to be just the handwriting itself will be very different. Right. It seems that's true. Right. This is going to expose the fact that the other letters weren't actually from him. The oh, myth of silver. Yeah, I I'm, thought, not, yeah. I'm not really sure Israel Hands gives but a that shit about mentioned. that. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's true. I don't. I again, I'm not sure that's what Israel. I think. No, no, no. Israel I, wouldn't know. But I would. But it just was interesting well, to me. 
I think there's also the more likely scenario here is that Israel Hands may not be able to write the note himself. Uh, okay. Interesting. Sure. Right. In our whole in our whole series of who is literate and who isn't literate right. in black uh-huh. sales world, I think there's a really good chance that Israel Hands is maybe yeah. not literate. And boy, is he ever vicious. He is so vicious with silver. Yep. That was hard to watch. The kick he's, in the face. He's cool. pretty he's pretty angry dude. It's true. Yeah, which again, Silver was able to use to his advantage because God, he is so smart. He's so brilliant and he is brave in this scene. Granted, he has yeah. nothing to lose. But right, brave, but we've, nonetheless. we've seen this is a type of bravery we've seen in Silver so many times that he mm-hmm. he he's always called himself a coward. I mean, I don't know if he does anymore, but he definitely did in the beginning and yet right. He calls himself a coward, but he's had these moments like the trap that killed the ranger crew. Like Mm -hmm. he's had moments throughout where he, in a way, almost like cloaks himself in this veneer of cowardice and then not stands up to, but like puts himself in the way of dangerous men Mm -hmm. with this kind of cloak of cowardice to protect himself. Yeah. Again, I don't know if this is one of those moments because Silver... it's hard to say. I, well, and I liked what did he say? I was so ready when he started talking about himself for him to say, "I am your king." That's what I was waiting for. Like mm-hmm. I'm the king of the pirates now. And instead, he says, "I'm no one from I nowhere. This. I love a wretch this so like much. you." Right. So wait, let let's before we get there, let's talk about how he talks about Israel Hand's story. Oh, okay. okay. Sure. So we have the first part, right, where he's pretty uh-huh. freaked out. And then when we get back to them, he's still chained up and Israel Hands is um is uh, gutting that fish, right? Scaling the fish. And Silver is I think doing an act of thinking out loud. I mean, I think he's, mm-hmm. you know, we're watching him put two and two together, but I think he had already right. put two and two together. This is this is definitely some pirate theater happening. Um so I love this. He says, I've heard a story, right? So the thing, mm-hmm. again, in the show, whenever somebody says the word story, it's like, you know, lights go yeah. off and I start paying attention in a slightly Alarm different bells. way. Uh-huh. Right. Um, I love this idea that if you know someone's story, mm-hmm. you maybe have power over them. Oh, almost like knowing someone's name in a fairy tale. Exactly. Uh-huh. That's exactly. That's what it made me think of. Yeah. Especially from the one main character that we do mm-hmm. not very famously now do not know his backstory. Uh-huh. Interesting. Yeah. He, okay. Of our main characters, he's yeah. the only one that we don't know his backstory. Right. And his mm. knowing Israel hand story is what gives him an in. Yeah, it gives him that power. Sure. Gives him the power to influence him. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and, you know, of course, Silver as a storyteller then frames the story in a way that's useful to him. Before he does his whole thing about I'm no one, he basically lays out the story about how Israel is no one. And yet he's the person who affected change. Yes. So Uh the idea that that Israel hands is the person who actually remember James McGraw Mm -hmm. told Thomas when he came back from visiting Nassau, the story of how the governor was deposed and how the pirates had killed his wife and his and his, I think, eight year old son. Yeah. Uh huh. And now Silver is saying, oh, you're that guy. You're the guy That's who right. did that. Those those famous pirates, they got credit for it. But he says it was actually another who cut the cord. Yeah. Cut the cord, I find, is really interesting language. Again, not to be, you know, again, I may regret someday putting so uh-huh. much weight on this whole Rebecca thing. But we started this season talking about pregnancy and childbirth. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And framing what Israel did, the power of the of the relatively nameless pirate being yeah. the one who cut the cord with civilization, 
just seems super significant to me. Yeah. Interesting. In that context. And then he says, you know, he tells the story about, and again, this is actually, there is supposedly historical teach. Now we're going to go back to historical Israel hands and fictional Israel hands. Right. Okay. Historical teach actually did randomly, uh, according to the stories again. Right. We, right. We, who knows? Yes. Right. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But according to the stories, historical teach did shoot historical Israel hands pretty randomly and flippantly, oh. not in the face, in the leg. Oh, uh huh. Um, but I love how, how this got incorporated into the story and made right, it about right. his eye. But I love that he says, you can understand my confusion given how Nassau's first king, speaking mm -hmm. of teach, mm -hmm. yes, uh -huh. cast you aside. And then his confusion is about why he stayed. So I want to talk for a minute about outsiders. Okay. So like all of our characters, to some extent, we've established our outsiders, right? Mm -hmm. This is why this is why they're in Nassau. John very explicitly said this to us. Like this is the commonality sure. of all of the backstories, that they're people who didn't fit. Uh-huh. Certainly. But the idea of Israel Hands and John Silver talking to each other. John mm -hmm. Silver, who was an outsider who was so attached to the idea of staying outside, but was drawn in versus mm -hmm. Israel hands, who was somebody who was inside outcast, mm -hmm. but never tried to get away. Like he always has stayed on the fringe. He never, right. he never did that thing that silver, at least in the beginning thought he wanted to do, right. which was just like, be free. Mm -hmm. Israel hands never wanted to be free obviously, because he's been right. hanging out by the wrecks. Hmm. He never left. He never went out to find some other fortune, even though his future amongst the pirates had been basically destroyed by Teach. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that Silver totally understands the core of who Israel Hands is. Right. Oh, in his story. And then Israel Hands says, fuck Teach. <laughs> Yes, he does. Yep. And then Silver says, fuck Teach. And did you notice that his voice changed? It's yeah. A new voice, too. Like, mm -hmm. we've seen Silver's voice change. Like, when he was ready to go in season three, when Billy had basically assigned him the job of going into the tavern when he ends up yes. um, killing yes. Dufresne. Mm -hmm. We saw, that was the first time I felt like we saw Silver, like, adopt a different voice. Like, he right. took and on, like... Theater. Mm -hmm. Right. This is a new voice. When he says, and this is what he says, he says, fuck teach. We are brothers who sail beneath the black. Mm -hmm. How can a man so like smart. that be the best of us? Mm -hmm. I'm so curious about this voice. Like, I feel like this voice is actually the closest to the voice to the treasure island voice like to the typical to the stereotypical oh, sure, pirate voice sure yeah yeah i hear that he doesn't That's keep it interesting he he uses it just for a little bit of his pirate theater in my eyes that bit of voice was actually that voice like the yeah. the pirate voice the sure. the like our you know that that pirate right. voice uh -huh. <laughs> yeah it's fascinating. So do we think that, like, well, I don't know. I don't even know if we can, like, know where that voice came from. Does that relate to backstory? Does that relate to pirate theater? Does it relate to both? I think to pirate theater. Yeah, I but definitely think so. it's not Israel Hand's accent either. Mm hmm I'm just Well, so I mean, he's, he's really creating this role of Long John Silver. He is. Right now he's creating it for himself. Right. Uh huh. And he said, he said that teach, we followed teach and that was almost the end of us. Now I'm here and things begin again. Yeah. So he's basically saying, let me hand you now a new story. Right. I am your king. Uh huh. I am your king. And yet he doesn't say that. He right. doesn't he, say it. He just implies. Yeah, it's really cool. Now we mm -hmm. get to the part where you he said. I am no one and then implies that he's king. Yeah. Right. It's really, it's really masterfully done. And this is, I mean, this is it. I feel like this is now, I feel like this is where Silver has taken what he learned from Flint. Mm-hmm. 
and what he learned from Maddie and maybe even yeah. what he learned from Billy. Ah, okay. And what he learned from his own self. Like, remember what mm-hmm. Luke said about how he was so busy always convincing everyone that he wasn't anything, that he wasn't a danger to them. Mm-hmm. And now he's kind of flipped that around and said, wait a minute, if you're nobody and I... I'm nobody, and yet I wield all this power. Right, and yet I did all these great things, yeah. Right. This new beginning for NASA could be not an era of the great pirates, of the Flints and the mm-hmm. Teaches and the Bellamies and all of and the Hornigolds. Right. Mm-hmm. And this goes back to what you've said from the beginning about, about uh, fraternity versus... Oh, yes. Uh-huh. Is that he's, he's perhaps he's saying, I'm offering you a kingdom of fraternity. Sure. A kingdom yeah. where, where a nobody can lead. And therefore, all of us who are nobody, all of us who are out there, sure. who is essentially everyone in NASA, anyone who is NASA mm-hmm. is an outcast of some sort. Mm-hmm. So if I'm offering you a kingdom of outcasts, run. By someone who is just an outcast, just like yeah. all of you. He just handed Israel hands a new story. Yes. Uh-huh. I like that very much. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot happening. Wow. And again, to bring this back to the whole Jacob and Israel thing, he's proposing a new nation. Oh, sure. Absolutely he is. Yeah. And I don't know. I just love it. I mean, it's like... Especially, especially since we've just had this whole argument between Flint and Billy about Mm -hmm. what we're doing and who we are and who we're advocating for. Right. Silver may have taken both sides of that argument. Oh, uh uh-huh. And integrated them. Mm. Like only he can. Yeah. In a way that only he can. Mm-hmm. And perhaps because he's, a, again, I'm now I'm just so fixated on the whole backstory, no backstory thing. Oh, uh-huh. Perhaps on some level, because he's a man with no backstory, mm-hmm. because he can be a no one. That yeah. was a that was a tool he used as a loner mm-hmm. once upon a time as a way to escape. But now he can use it as a way to lead the idea that I am no one. And yet... Mm-hmm. I can do all this crazy shit. Right. I love hmm. it so much. <laughs> no, love, yeah. I love this a lot. <laughs> there's so much happening in this episode. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and so it's interesting because they end the conversation about who would pay for him more. And that's what brings us to Max. And yet yeah. we see at the end of the Max scene that this mm-hmm. possibly moved Israel hands in a way that transcends you know a payout Mm -hmm. wow yeah yep is worth so much more right he's so smart Mm -hmm. he's so smart but again i think he started to believe believe his own mythology at the same time oh definitely yeah and is you know israel hands clearly was a person who wanted to belong Mm -hmm. and perhaps what he needed was someone like this to offer Mm. him a place to belong to again silver might have found the story that can be the actual story for people who are outsiders for people who are Mm -hmm. living on the fringe to believe in that that transcends you know flint's thing of like I have this great idea and you don't understand. Right. Well, I have this great idea and you don't understand it and you're actually expendable. So it doesn't really matter if you don't understand it, which we've heard from a lot of people. Like Eleanor's also said that like Frazier at some Uh point said, I don't understand what you're thinking. She's like, it's okay because I understand it. Right. Yeah. And Jack said it once too. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Jack has also said the same thing. Mm -hmm. Versus someone like Billy who cares very much about the individuals, about his Mm -hmm. group of people. But that makes him short-sighted. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps Silver has actually integrated all these different sure. ways of seeing the world into mm-hmm. a way that would actually move 
these people, these people who are outcasts in a way that would make him both like and feared. Again, Mm -hmm. he also has the influence of Maddie, as John brought up. Yep. I can't wait for their reunion. Uh Uh-huh. Not a democratic influence. (laughs) No, not. Uh He is talking about, you know, he has been cast as a king and he's Mm -hmm. talking about kings. So... Again, this is not this is not what we should hold up as you know as our form of of coalition and government. But in this world, perhaps what Silver is now that he's he's integrated all of the different things in a way that he could actually be the most powerful leader amongst them. Yeah, absolutely. So then we have at the end Max meeting with Silver, Max and her lackeys, I guess, meeting with Silver yeah. and Israel Hands. And uh, boy, Max, I yeah, she. This is where we really get illustrated that she's given up any sense of like trying to not show which side she's yeah. on. Which surprised me when she said uh, a big name for so small a man. Oh uh, yeah, that's harsh, man. <laughs> it was harsh, and I I have trouble remember. Remind me why they would have such a falling out. Um, again, I don't think this is I about mean, them she specifically. Him, I felt like. <laughs> I don't think this is specific to him. I think this is oh, about, about piracy. It's about pirates. She's just really okay. pissed off that the pirates are still fighting dead. this battle. Like, sh- I think, yeah. I think honestly, she's just like, guys, seriously. <laughs> Stop being children. <laughs> right. I had this whole plan for me and civilization okay, sure, and my money, sure. and you all are really fucking with my plans. Uh huh. Okay, I got it. That makes sense. Because I was trying to think of a specific falling out for the two no, of them. Okay. No, no, not sense. at all. I think she's just really annoyed right now. Um, and right. And she has a plan. She's like, look, I'm not going to kill you. Right. I do love that she says, I don't want you to be your friend. I want this to end. And for that, yes. I need you to end. And she doesn't yeah. mean you, Silver, the guy. Right. She means piracy. I get it. Yeah. Well, and she yeah. Sees, means you, Silver, the legend. I mean, she's just <laughs> like, you are now the rallying point of this thing that I would really like to stop. Yeah, so, which I love that when she says, I'm tired of this, this thing that perpetuates itself with anger and bluster and blood. Exactly. I mean, she's That's being super, too. she's super reasonable here. Like we're rooting for Yeah, men. I mean, it's reasonable, but it's also damned risky. Sure. Oh, no, no. She, right. She she has reached the point where she must make a stand. And mm-hmm. it's really scary because she th- she definitely thought she had the other hand upper hand here. Right. She mm-hmm. thought that this was going to work out. She had her and it, and again, I love that she says I'm going to like t- I you know, part of me would just like to kill you right now. Yeah. Cuz that would be super easy, but then she says, "But what am I if I spend my days pleading for civility and then do dark things by the cover of night?" Mm-hmm. And this is where me being me lover of max is just like you know what i love you still because you have compromised yourself and you've been compromised but like deep down you are still a person of morals yes yeah that's definitely true and again and willing to put herself in really uncomfortable position for the sake Mm -hmm. of that but but she says she's like look i'm going to like hide you away and send you far away because you need to not be a factor in this whole scenario anymore right. but i'm not gonna kill you mm-hmm. fair i i mean fair. I, again yeah. super happy when it works out that israel uh-huh. like turns out to be the crazy badass and like saves silver and then silver saves saves israel like i mm-hmm. love the, how this ends but the rational side of me is just like yeah max you're the ones you're the one who's actually being reasonable here mm-hmm. and still at the same time super excited that it doesn't work out in her favor (laughs) well and then silver and hand become such an amazing team yep that was that was pretty extraordinary to watch that was really fun yeah i know right so i love that i was glad that max got away unscathed yes although again i I don't know what i want to see happen for her it's so weird it's so hard i have so many allies Right. I want I good know. things for everyone. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Right. This not going to happen. Yep. Liz, this is the last mm-hmm. season of Black Sails. I know. I know. Crazy shit's going to happen and it's going to break your heart. I know. Just, you just need mm. to you just need to like accept that. 
<laughs> absorb, sure. absorb that information mm-hmm. and just be like, okay, I'm here for the ride. And I'm hoping that my favorite characters come out of this somewhat unscathed. Somewhat, yeah. And that's still not going to happen. But <laughs> I'm still hoping that Max comes mm-hmm. out unscathed. Right. Um, again, mm-hmm. You know, there are things worth, worse than death. We know that Silver's going to survive. Sure. He's not going to survive as the person that as we have who, loved. Yeah. Right. So, nor Billy, nor Flint. Mm-hmm. Max, being being a construction of the show and not of history and not of Treasure Island, we don't right. know. We don't Heaven know where. Is. We Yeah. We, she's, she's in the place of unknown. We don't know. Not that we really know what's going to happen to any of the historical right. or Treasure Island characters, but we really don't know what's going to happen with Max. For sure. Mm-hmm. You know, we've actually, it feels like Silver and Max have had a lot of interactions in this show. Mm-hmm. They've actually no, had, yeah. they've actually had very few. They, yeah. Almost all early too. I think it would be really interesting to track where they both stand. Like it would be interesting now to go back. Or maybe at the end, go back through all of their interactions and see mm-hmm. where they both stand on the pragmatism versus dreamer yeah. scale. I mean, Max always are pragmatists. Like, she's never stopped being that. Sure, she, sure. But it's – so I guess it's really interesting just for Silver, mm-hmm. who started out as our pragmatist and has gone more and more and more in the direction of our dreamer. Mm-hmm. And I just find that interesting in this conversation. We definitely have that. Max is like, dude, nothing against you personally, but this needs to end. Yes. You know, shit's getting crazy and you're, Mm -hmm. you're kind of a rallying point for the crazy. That is true. Yeah. And Silver's just like, Silver's just like pirate coalition, big dreams. You know, you're going to want in on this because we're kind of awesome because we're pirates. (laughs) (laughs) Which is very different than conversations that the two of them have had in the past. It's true. Yeah. Whereas in the beginning, they were like super pragmatist together. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's always made me notice this is that one is that one scene where Silver basically offers her the gold. And that's the moment where where like they had been pragmatist together. Yes. Mm hmm. And then he's just like going off on his crazy thing about Flint and his like ability to make, you know, gold hundreds of miles away disappear disappear. and Max is Mm -hmm. and Max is giving him this look like wait a minute Mm -hmm. I I thought that you and I were the similar types of people and then now you're like batshit crazy about this guy Flynn (laughs) you just say dinner (laughs) (laughs) right exactly Uh right Silver's like I say meaning of birds and Max is like dinner (laughs) yes Uh uh-huh right this is just a really, really stark division between of them. Mm-hmm. And this is the first time that they're like having this not only kind of division of vision, but like division mm-hmm. of actual allegiance. Yeah. And they're, well, maybe both of them are not being pragmatists anymore because they're both, because they both have their vision. Like she has the civilization vision, sure. and he has the pirate yeah. kingdom vision. And so maybe, maybe that's what's separating them. I like hmm. that. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe Max Max is also now no not being a pragmatist because of her dreams. Okay. Let's keep track of that as well. Yeah. We definitely should. She yeah. certainly more than any time any time in the past has made herself vulnerable because mm-hmm. Huh. Maybe she's not being a pragmatist. Maybe she's being an idealist versus Beringer and that's putting her in danger. And she's being a different kind of idealist versus Silver, and that's putting her in danger. Oh, Max. I want Max to be safe and happy. Uh, What show are you watching, Daphne? (laughs) I'm watching Black Sails and being in Uh denial about what Black Sails does to Uh my people. (laughs) I love you, Black Sails. Mm. You break my heart, Black Sails. All right. I'm ready to move on to our last stage of our episode. Ready to guns! Full compliment! Okay, well then, what was your favorite part? Oh, I, I didn't think about that. And now I'm super self-conscious. Oh, why is that? 
Toby Schmitz gave me shit for making for saying that everything is my favorite part. Uh, well, fair enough. <laughs> so, um, and yet, having said this, mm-hmm. my favorite part is the conversation between Jack and Teach. <laughs> yep, I think that's mine too. Though it really was lovely and beautifully done. That was also my favorite part. So I think you're completely right. Yeah, that was gorgeous. the story, the laughter together the recognition of the importance of valuing Vane's virtues over their own. I thought yeah. it was gorgeous. Yeah. The like laughter slash, I kind of have like a little bit of tears in my eyes. Like sure. Is- yeah. Yeah. Sharing grief together. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Almost the kind of story someone would tell at a wake. Yeah. Yep. Fine. Mm-hmm. Fine. Toby Schmitz. Again, my favorite <laughs> thing has to do with Jack. <laughs> He's a great character. He's a great character. No question. Great, <laughs> great scene. Really phenomenal scene, actually, I have mm. to admit. Without without any malice, that is a phenomenal mm-hmm. scene. Okay. So what is, we did not think about this ahead of time. What is yeah. our prediction we want for next episode? Mm, okay. I've got a, our okay. prediction for next episode. Will Eleanor manage to get away on her route to Philadelphia? Oh, does she get... Okay, I think that's good. Yep, that's a great prediction. Whoops. Okay. Mm-hmm. I okay, like that. So make your predictions. We're not really sure how this game is going to play out because we won't really get your answers until the episode airs. So we may end up always having to give pirate names two episodes after. Yeah. We're just going to play but it we'll by get ear. We'll get you caught up. Yeah. We'll get you caught up. We're going we're gonna to catch up our uh, spreadsheet yes. so that we know uh-huh. who has what. Right. Uh huh. <laughs> We've been a little busy with, you know, interviews and such things to make y'all happy, things to make us happy. And that's about it. I think we've done uh, episode 30. That's right. So we'll see you on Sunday night for the next live tweet. Yes, we're, su- we're super excited to be doing live tweets about new episodes mm-hmm. with y'all. Yes, yes. Follow the hashtag Fathoms Deep. Yep. And until next time from Common Room Radio, I'm Liz Stevens. And I'm Daphne Olive. Fathoms Deep is a Common Room Radio production. For more information and access to other programs, please visit us at commonroomradio.com. To show your support, pledges of as little as a dollar a month can be made to patreon.com slash commonroomradio. Join the conversation by using the hashtag Fathoms Deep and follow us on Twitter at Black Salescast. We ask that you keep your tweets respectful and positive and please avoid spoilers. If you have more to say, we want to hear it in all its spoiler glory. Email us at podcast at commonroomradio.com with Fathoms Deep in the subject line. Thanks for listening. He said, well, they're, but they're motivated by rent. Re- <laughs> when he wanted to go chase, chase the revenge, he uh-huh. said, they're motivated by revenge, by vengeance. <laughs> by vengeance, uh, yes. yeah. Boy, is that appropriate.